Bore, uh, thank you so much, uh, Omura Sensei, for being with us today, and very welcome uh, at this conference. Thank you, thank you, and it's up to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> I'm honored to be invited to give a presentation at this conference. Uh, this time, I'd like to talk about Dogen Zenji's poetry as an expression of his insight of the Dharma. I usually, when I give a talk, I usually uh, don't write a draft, but try to speak directly. But this time, because Time is limited in 20 minutes, so uh, try not to waste any time. I wrote the draft, so this time I read uh, the draft. Dogen Zenji was a Zen master, the founder and the leader of the first Soto Zen monastery in Japan. He is also considered one of the eminent Buddhist thinkers. Not only that, but he was also a poet. He wrote both Japanese poetry called Waka and Chinese poems known as Kanshi. There is a collection of his Waka poems, which include 66 poems attributed to him. His Chinese poems are included in Eihei Kōrok, Dogen's extensive record. We find more than 300 Chinese poems as a part of his formal Dharma discourses. 125 poems are included in the volume 10 of the text. Today, I'd like to introduce one Waka poem and one Chinese poem to give you a sense of his ability to express the Dharma through poetry. Before talking about his poems, I need to discuss Dogen's attitude toward poetry. It is well known among Dogen scholars and practitioners that in Shobogenzo Zuimonki, Dogen denigrates the value of literature, particularly poetry. In a sense, he was a poet who did not like poetry. This was, this was just like his approach to Zen. He was a Zen master who did not like Zen. Uh, he said in Zui Monkey, uh, for example, uh, section 2.8. Impermanence is swift. Life and death is a great matter because the duration of our lives is short. If you wish to learn something and you would like to study something, just practice Buddha way and study the Buddha Dharma, literature, poetry, and the like are useless. It is unnecessary to even say why we should give them up. And uh, section 3, 6, he says, the monks these days are fond of studying literature as a grounding to compose verses or write Dharma words. This is wrong. Even if you cannot compose verses, just write what you think in your mind. Even if you st your style is not sophisticated, write down the Dharma dates. And I have been fond of studying literature since my childhood. And even now, I have a tendency to contemplate the beauty in the words of non-Buddhist text. Sometimes I even defer to the selections of refined literature or other classic texts. Still, 
I think it is meaningless and it should cease immediately. In these talks, Dogen is saying two things. He tells us that since childhood, he thoroughly studied and enjoyed literature, including both Chinese and Japanese prose and poetry. He was knowledgeable and wrote his own poems even after he became a Buddhist monk. But he is also saying that he believes such knowledge and writing skills are not only valueless, but also even obstacles for the study of the Buddha way. Some people think, based on these sayings, that Dogen was contradicting himself by writing so many poems. However, from the time of Shakyamuni, Buddhist masters have questioned the ability of language to express the Dharma, which is beyond discrimination and conceptualization. However, all of these masters try to express the Dharma using language, including Nagarjuna, and Dogen Zenji was one of them. As he discussed in the Shobo Genzo Fasikuru, being able to speak or do toku, Dogen never uh, negated the importance of expressing the Dharma with or without language. About the essential point of Zazen practice, he wrote, think of not thinking. How do you think of not thinking? Beyond thinking, in Fukan Zazengi. Zazen is manifesting the Dharma beyond thinking, through the practice of just sitting, or shikantaza, where both thinking and not thinking are present. His poetry is speaking of the Dharma, that is unspeakable, or expressing the inexpressible. Uh, the Waka poem I would like to introduce is titled po uh, Poem Expressing the Original Face. Original face is in Japanese, Honrai no Menmoku. Uh, this work of poem in Japanese are uh, as follows. Haru wa hana, natsu hototogisu aki wa tsuki. Yuki, kuyu yuki kie de suzushi karikeri. My English translation is spring flowers, summer cuckoos, autumn moon. Winter, snow doesn't melt, all seasons pure and upright. The original phrase here refers to the true reality of all beings before it is processed by our discriminating, limited and self-centered minds. This reality beyond thinking is not something metaphysical but rather concrete phenomenal reality as it is, where we are included in it. Yet, because we are inside it, we cannot perceive it as the object of our six sense organs. Reality lies beyond the separation between subject and object, in which a subject conceives of things outside itself as object. Flowers, cuckoos, moon, snow, and we ourselves are the element of spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And each of these uh, particulars fully expresses each of the seasons throughout the year without losing their particularity. 
we can find an example of the scenery of each season as the true reality of all things in the lines composed by the Chinese Soto Zen master. Uh, let me use uh, Japanese pronunciation of his name. His name was Wanshi Shogak, uh, who lived uh, from 1091 to 1157. That appears as the verse, verse commentary of the first case in the Book of Serenity or show your rock. His verse is, the unique breeze of reality. Do you see? Continuously, creation runs her loom and shuttle, weaving the ancient brocade, incorporating the forms of spring. But nothing can be done about Manjushri's leaking. The case is titled The World Honored One Ascends the Seed. This comes from a story in which the Buddha ascends his seat and before he says anything, Manjushri, the Bodhisattva of Wisdom, strikes the gravel and says, Clearly observe the Dharma of the King of Dharma. The Dharma of the King of Dharma is thus. Then the Buddha gets down from his seat without saying anything. This koan is about the true reality beyond language, the original face. In one she's birth, the word used for creation is in Chinese hua mu or in Japanese ke bo, which literally means the mother who is the creator of all things. This mother continuously learns her loom, loom and shuttle, that is weaving. The horizontal thread, the weft, represent space, while the vertical thread, the warp, symbolizes time. Using time and space as her loom, the mother weaves the scenery of each season, as beautiful as golden brocade. I think Dogen is expressing the same idea as Wanshi, the pure and upright scenery of each season is the true reality that is our original face. In Shobo Genzo Baika, Pram Brosan, Dogen says, to paint spring, we should not paint willow, pram, peach, or apricot, apricot trees. We should paint spring itself. To paint willow, plum, peach, or apricot trees is to paint willow, plum, peach, or apricot trees. That is not painting spring. This is not to say that spring cannot be painted. To paint spring, we need to paint something particular with paintable forms and colors, such as willow, plum, peach, or apricot trees, and yet painting these things are simply painting individual things. How can we paint spring? That is the entire network of interdependent origination. By painting, certain particular phenomenal things, one way might be not painting or not composing poems and just experience the beauty of the flowers. But then how can we share the beauty and joy with other people? To do so, 
We need our own experience, insight, and sensitivity of the non-duality of the conventional truth and the ultimate truth. Manjushri is leaking in the last line of one she's verse means that in contrast to the Buddha's silence, Manjushri verbally leaked the secret by explaining that the silence is the reality beyond dualistic language. This explanation is something extra, but without his leaking it, we would not understand the meaning of the Buddha's silence. Dogen's waka is another example of this leaking. I would like to introduce a Chinese poem from Dogen's extensive record, Eihei Korok, Volume 10. In Japanese, his poem is Sairai no sodo wo ware higashi ni tsutau Tsuki wo migaki kumo wo tagayashite kofu wo shitau Sezoku no kouin tonde ani itaran ya Shinzan no setsu ya sou an no uchi My English translation Title is Mountain Dwelling The ancestral way comes from the west I transmit east, polishing the moon, cultivating clouds. I long for the ancient wind. How could red dust from the mundane world fly up to here? Snowy night in the deep mountains in my grass hut. This is one of the 15 poems about mountain dwelling or Sankyo that Dogen wrote after moving from the capital city of Kyoto to the remote mountains of Echizen in 1243. In this poem, Dogen describes his practice with his Sangha in the deep mountains during a cold, snowy winter night. He and his monks quietly practice the ancestral way transmitting from the West by Bodhidharma and further transmitted through nine, 19 generations in China until Dogen's teacher Tenton Rujin or Tendo Nyojo. Dogen himself transmitted it to Japan and planted the seedling of this teaching in the soil of Japan. Because the poem contains the line, In my grass hut, this poem might have been composed during their first winter in Echizen, before the new monastery building was constructed. The second line, Polishing the moon, cultivating crowds, is a translation of Kei gets ko un. Kei means clear, bright, shine, or as a verb to polish. Gets means moon, ko means to cultivate, or to plow. Un means crowd. Similar expressions were used by Wan Shi in volume 8 of Wan Shi Zenji Korok, uh, Wan Shi's extensive record. One is Chogetsu Ko Un, or Tsuki ni Tsuri Kumo ni Tagayasu, Fishing the Moon, Cultivating the Clouds. Another is Ko un shu gets tsuki kumo ni tagayashi tsuki ni ueru. Cultivating underneath, underneath clouds, planting seeds in the moonlight. The meaning of 
uh, the first one, ko un shugetsu, is clear. Shu means seed, or the two soul seeds. This phrase describes a farmer's diligent hard work. The farmer cultivates the field during the daytime underneath clouds and sows seeds in the moonlight. He works all day and into the evening. This phrase describes monks' diligent continuous practice. Another one, Chogets Ko Un, uh, is uh, can be interpreted in two ways. The first is the same as the phrase above, a fisherman is fishing in the moonlight, moonlight, and a farmer is cultivating day and night. This symbolizes monks practicing diligently day and night just like the fisherman and the form, uh, farmer and the farmer work in their respective places. The second possible interpretation is fishing the moon and cultivating the clouds. In this case, both the moon and clouds are the object of the respective verbs fishing and cultivating. In this case, monks are doing a different kind of work compared to the fisherman and the farmer. The monks are fishing for the moon, meaning the true reality of all things or the universal truth. They are also cultivating clouds, that is, the field of emptiness. In the case of the line, polishing the moon, cultivating clouds in Dogen's version. Obviously, the moon and the clouds are the object of the verbs. K here means to polish. The monk's practice is to polish the full moon, even though it is already perfectly clear and bright and to cultivate the field of emptiness. I think this expression is suitable given Dogen's insight about the identity of practice and verification. At his monastery, monks practice diligently yearning after the ancient style. Dogen expresses the practice as K gets polishing the moon. His practice is polishing the full moon, which is already perfectly clear, bright, and shining, and cultivating the clouds, that is the field of emptiness. In this way, he expresses his understanding that both monks practice of Zazen as well as their everyday activities that support their practice are all themselves verification. This is the practice following the ancient ancestor Bodhidharma's style, that is, no gaining. Within this practice, there is no way the dust of the mundane world can sneak in. In the deep mountain, it is slowing quietly. In this Chinese poem, Dogen describes monk's quiet practice in which the bright moon is manifested and the field of emptiness is cultivated. Their practice is the actualization 
of the ultimate truth beyond language. And this poem expresses the inexpressible reality and its actualization in their practice as a day-to-day -day concrete uh, practice of Zazen and other activities. Well, this is what I prepared. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Okamura Sensei. Thank you. Uh, uh, if I may, I, I, have, I have a question for you. Okay. And um, uh, do, during your speech, you, in a way, you underline the cruciality of poetry, uh, not also in literature, but uh, not only in literature, but also in the practice. And so, um, my question is, some way, uh, can we recognize poetry, a special strength, let's say, in expressing the spirit of Dharma more than or in comparison to the conventional language? Is poetry something special? Uh, I think so, you know, from the time of Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, almost all uh, Buddhist sutras uh, uh, include uh, poetry. So, uh, poet poetry is important uh, to express the Dharma that is beyond uh, thinking or beyond uh, uh, discrimination. You know, when Dogen, not Dogen, but Shakyamuni Buddha attained awakening, he had hesitation to teach because it is too uh, profound and subtle. Even he thought, even if he tried to share uh, what he experienced to other people, people don't understand. But somehow, you know, the Indian god Brahma came down and asked him to teach. So he decided to share the Dharma, what he experienced with others. To do so, I think he needs to translate his experience into languages. And he continued to sit uh, at the same place uh, that is Buddha Gaya by himself for several, at least several weeks. And that was when he, in a sense, he interpreted what he experienced and how he can express using language to share uh, his awakening to those five bucks. That was the beginning of Buddhist history. And somehow those five monks could underst understand, and not only understand, but they had the same awakening. That was why it was said, you know, when five monks understood what Buddha taught, the sutra said, uh, there are uh, six uh, arahats, that is, uh, uh, enlightened people. So, Buddha's awakening and those five monks' awakening are not uh, discriminated. They had the same experience. After that, for more than 40 years, he continued, Buddha continued to teach using language. And those languages were memorized and recorded uh, as a sutra. Uh, so when we study Buddha's teachings, we study using languages, uh, both uh, poetry and prose. So first we understand uh, as a concept or theory, but uh, I, I think we need to trust translate uh, our understanding into our practice to share the same 
uh, awakening. So to understand Buddha's teaching, not only intellectually, we, we need to study language using poetry or prose, uh, but uh, we need a practice and to share the same experiences. And, uh, you know, poetry is more, can be more direct than, uh, you know, using uh, prose that is uh, uh, necessary to separate in subject and object and uh, separation between uh, the uh, concept, the function of language to make separation. But uh, poetry can uh, express uh, the reality we experience without uh, making so much concept conceptualization. Uh, that is what is called prapancha, in, for example, in Nagarjuna's teachings. So uh, I think poetry has some uh, special uh, power or ability uh, to directly transmit or express what we uh, experience or what Buddha experienced. Uh, that is my understanding, you know, poetry is really uh, useful and important. And uh, people like Nagarjuna or Dogen can uh, write really beautiful and, pro uh, and beautiful poetry express the profound meaning and also reality beyond discrimination. But people like us, like me at least, cannot, and I don't mind about, I cannot write poetry because, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a poet, but uh, because I have been working on translation, I studied languages, and also because of uh, my practice, somehow I can combine my uh, understanding by studying uh, poetry and theoretical writings and uh, translate it into my actual practice. So I think this is uh, studying poetry or memorizing poetry is really important and meaningful for us to study uh, what Buddha taught and what Buddha experienced. Well, this is my answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Okumura Sensei. Thank you. Thank it's a you. very interesting and unusual perspective on mm -hmm. the Buddha teaching. So, thanks again. Thank hey, you very much. Thank you.